Live from the House of LeMay Makeup and Dressing Room. Here comes Amber. Stop what you're doing. Here comes Amber. She's just doing what she can. Here comes Amber. Cue the spotlight. Here comes Amber. With two drinks in her hand. The matriarch of fashion. Glasses, you can't look away. Ask her, does she do it? It's really nothing to it. She's got that sound on her game. If you have a party, or if you're feeling naughty, call up the house of the maid. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn off all cell phones and get ready for your host, Amber LeMay. This recent trend of banning, putting these laws together um, is a rallying call. I really see it that way. I really, really think that this is an opportunity for our allies and our um community to join really tightly and to really say no we will not put up with this and you know vote these suckers out i mean it's r ridiculous you know i've been chased down by cars i have been things thrown at me i've had people curse and make slurs as a lgbt person as a non-binary person i face hate uh, depending on how i appear in public what can we do to stop it i teach people about allyship and i teach people about also the the concerns of um voting and making sure we are having the right people put in place so i go to town council meetings and i'm not afraid to be like this needs to change right you are the leaders in this town or in these places. What can you need to be able to do something about it? The interesting thing that we saw with Target recently, you know, a great display and realizing there's a commercial value to that and, and them doing that. Um, but, and our organization responded to them on Twitter going, hey, look, LGBT people, you know, have people coming at them all the time and they stand up strong and don't back down. For you to have a pride parade, or you know, pride display in selling merchandise and to back down so quickly, you are not an ally and you're not embracing what everyday LGBT people have to go through. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Amber Live. First, I want you to like, share, subscribe. Thank you very much. So what do butt bites, lots of sperm, and chaos in Washington have in common? They're all a part of this week's news briefs. We all recall the line, the dingoes got my baby, from the movie A Cry in the Dark. Well, the dingoes are at it again. In April, on an Australian beach, a French woman was bitten on the butt by a dingo while sunbathing. The canine approached the woman, nipped her buttocks before she yelped in pain, and jumped up, and then the dingo goes back for seconds. The bum-biting dingo was humanely euthanized after authorities believed it had also attacked multiple other tourists, including a seven-year-old boy and another woman. Last week was Father's Day, and for Jonathan Mayer, his mailbox must have been overflowing. Mayer is a prolific sperm donor and claims that he has at least 550 children all over the world. His fathering spree began in 2007 when Meyer, age 42, registered as a sperm donor at 11 clinics and at the Cryo Sperm Bank. He also joined Facebook groups for women and couples who want but cannot have kids. He lied to everyone. He told each clinic he would exclusively donate there and told each prospective mother he only had about 10 children. When asked by German media why he wants so many kids, he replied, I want to do something meaningful in my life. He's being sued over concerns that his repeated donations could increase the likelihood of incestuous relations. You think? I say cut that thing off. Now, in this week's Pot Calling the Kettle Black segment, we bring you United States Representatives Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lorraine Boebert. On Wednesday, both are trying to be the first to introduce resolutions calling for the impeachment of President Biden. Boebert went through the channels and leveraged a procedural 
to force a vote on her own, undercutting Green, who had failed to go follow the rules. Green then said, I've donated to you. I've defended you. But you've been nothing but a little bitch to me. Asked whether there was any chance the two would reconcile after the confrontation, Green said, absolutely not. She has genuinely been a nasty little bitch to me. I guess it takes one to know one. And that's this week's headlines. So come on in. Hey, Amber, how you doing? Happy whatever week this is. <laughs> oh, my God. 550 children. Oh, that's almost as many as we have shows. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, I guess that's the other way around. But <laughs> well, 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 Russell, we do have a great show. And what's the best way for people to watch it? Well, the best way for people to watch is always on YouTube. And that's youtube.com slash Amber Live. And the reason for that is because... When you go to YouTube, Amber's in full HD. And the other reason is that all your friends are over there in the chat room. And Amber and I are probably there in the chat room. So you'll want to come in and talk to us, ask us questions, comment on the show. We want to hear from you in that chat room. Keep it active and fun. Yes, yes. Ask us questions. Ask the people questions. Just have some fun. Tell us what you had for dinner. We'll put up with that, too. <laughs> what else do you want to talk about, Russell? Well, you know what I like to talk about. The Boostiers. We love our Boostiers. And you can see our list there of our great Boostiers so far this year. They are very helpful. But you know what? There's always new bills coming in. So if you could help us out, that would be a little great great thing. Use that Venmo at RJD Pro or go to www.amberlive.tv and look for the support Amber Live donate button to use your credit card if you don't want to use Venmo. And you can become one of those fabulous Boostiers who we love to thank. And the Boostiers really are the lifeblood of this show. So thank you all to our Boostiers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And what we'll give you is a great show tonight. Tell us about it, Russell. Oh, my goodness. Do we have a great one? We have an incredible actress who you may not know her by name, but you have seen her. She has been around acting since she was very, very young and has been in a lot of very famous movies. Her name's Brenda Curran, and some of her movies include The World According to Garp, In Cold Blood, Taps, and even, for those of you who love B-horror movies, Chud, the cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers, a great movie from the 80s. <laughs> and she has great stories about some of her co-stars in those movies. That It's really a fun, fun interview. What else is on tonight? Uh, well, we also have a rant coming up. We've got Amber's altercations. We've got Rocco. And we've got a short tribute to our dear departed friend, Marguerite. Um, yes. who today, uh, the day the show is running, is her celebration of life in Vermont. So for those of you who can't make it to that, we'll give you a, a, a quick look at her, some of the wonderful things she did and what an amazing person she was and her alter ego, Mike. Was. <laughs> great <laughs> people, well. great friends. All right, let's get on with the show. Brenda Curran is an Obie Off-Broadway Theater Award winning actress, has appeared in films like In Cold Blood, The World According to Garp, Taps, Reds, as well as the cult classic Chud. Brenda co-founded What Girls Know, a theater program for adolescent girls, and she is also associated with the Tennessee Williams Festival held in New Orleans. Oh, we have a lot to talk about. Brenda, come on in. Hey, Amber. Hey, Brenda. First off, I want to say happy birthday. Your birthday was this week. Yes, it was um, two days ago. <laughs> and how did you celebrate? I had a wonderful day. Uh, I, li I live in New Brunswick, New Jersey now. So I, I have a seven minute walk if I walk really fast and, uh, and to the New Jersey transit, I go into New York City and I met um, my great friend and sort of conspiratorial collaborator, uh, Irene Glazo, she's a wonderful actor. And we went to, to uh, scope out a theater space at Theater Lab uh, for our, we're going to co-produce um, Terrence McNally's play, A Perfect Ganesh. It's just going to be a sort of a begin, a, the birth of our production this summer, with hopeful, with a hopeful 
future ahead. Now, will uh, will you be appearing in the play? Yes. Oh, I've read the play. Um, it was marvelous. It's marvelous, and yeah. that's a, a great vehicle. 1993. Yes. It's All right. So, uh, Brenda, tell me. And then I you... came home and had a party on the roof and uh, with uh, my favorite people and my wife. And um, so it just, everything was wonderful. Well, good. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right, Brenda, um, where, where did you celebrate your first birthday? Meaning where, where, did you, where were you born and where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Oxford, North Carolina. Um, it was a tobacco growing town. It was the county seat of Granville County near Durham and Chapel Hill. And my granddaddy did grow tobacco. Um, so I had, and my mother was a Yankee. Uh, so there was a, you know, I had, as my great teacher, John Shear said, I had the two energies going, oh. <laughs> the opposing <laughs> energies. <laughs> you use what you got. Um, how did you get the theater bug? I uh, was mainly interested in sports, and I um, I stuttered uh, as a, as a kid. So I, it wasn't a blah 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 stutter. It was a, and nothing would come out. Hmm. So I, um, you know, I I went to a camp uh, in Swannanoa, North Carolina. It was a um, in God's country, uh, in, in just in terms of how beautiful it is. And it was for 20 girls. And I went there to ride horses and swim and do archery and riflery. And, and I, I panicked when I saw that dramatics was a requisite. It wasn't an, it, it wasn't something I could choose. We were doing everything. And then I made this incredible discovery that I did not stutter when I was playing another part. It's not an uncommon uh, story with um, some actors who stutter. So, and singers as well, yes. Pardon? And singers as well. Oh, absolutely. Yes, singing is the antidote to stuttering. Okay, you got your start there in, in the camp. Where did yes. you go from there? Well, I just have to brag a little bit because I, um, I did win the best Actress Award at for in that for our production of South Pacific, playing Bloody Mary. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> did you black your teeth? I did, I did. I mean, I did everything that would uh, I would be run out of run out on a rail <laughs> in these days. But uh, we were twenty girls and we performed the entire musical for a an audience of five. <laughs> didn't care. It, it was full out. So, what did you do when you get home? When you got home? I felt a little lost. Um, and I ended up my uh, every, you know, excuse my language, the shit hit the fan with my family. And it was a big uh, change for us all. And I ended up getting on a Greyhound bus and going to Kansas to live with my aunt and uncle and cousins. And um, so I ended up in Kansas. I, I, at age 16, I ended up back with my mother and I was a difficult teenager. So she was, you know, I luckily for all of us, I went to the Girl Scout camp. And uh, then the last Sunday I was there fell off a 200 foot cliff um, at, on the, uh, landed on a highway, you know, sort of slanted on my feet. And uh, it was by the Susquehanna River, two fishermen were in a boat, rowboat. They rowed to shore, um, came, the one came and covered me up while the other went, I don't know how far, to find his car and then drive to find a telephone. So um, my, all to say is my sports career uh, was over. And, but luckily I, I had this other love I had discovered at Camp Albanico. 
And so I went to the, I, it was a little school in Olathe, Kansas, and I went to um, uh, Mr. Bill Moore's, he was the English teacher, and he kept his English classroom open to for those of us who wanted to put on a play. And I was still on crutches, so I ran, uh, we did a beautiful um, one-act play by um, Jean Giraudoux called The Apollo of Balak. It was just a one-act play. And I ran, it was a double-deck tape recorder, and I, my job was to run the tape recorder, and we, and the music was Under Paris Skies. And I felt as though I had written the music, I was, you know, I was conducting it. Uh, it, it was, um, it was so lucky that I had that love that I could go, you know, I couldn't go to the gym. So I went to the English class and um, was part of making that beautiful one act play in the English classroom at Olathe High School. Uh, where did you go to college? KU. University of Kansas. And I had a um, very a fortunate time there. I, I still stuttered, but uh, when I signed up for the theater department, you know, they had general auditions and I, uh, I got scared at the last minute and I said, I'm just here to do props. <laughs> um, I wrote it on my index card, so I didn't audition for anything until uh, Somehow I got the nerve to audition for the grandmother in some play and got a lot of laughs. Uh, so that I had, that was it. That was it. And then I was chosen to go uh, on this USO tour of uh, the Music Man. And uh, then the incredible thing was that was back in 19, I'm going to say it, 64. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the time of uh, cultural exchange programs. So six of us were chosen to go to um, Eastern Europe, Poland, Czechoslovakia, the former Yugoslavia and Romania. And it was just the most amazing three months of my life. And then when I came back, I, I was, uh, excuse me, trying to make up courses in, outside of the theater because I'd missed, I'd missed a lot of school. And I was renting a room from a Steve and Julia Callahan and it, they had this Victorian house uh, in Lawrence, Kansas. And I, my room was at the, um, the top of the stairs and I, the phone rang and I happened to answer it. It was my acting teacher, uh, Dr. Brooking, but I hadn't seen him for months because I was not going into the department. And he said, Oh, Brenda, I'm glad you answered the phone. Uh, these Hollywood people are here. They're, um, they're making this movie of uh, In Cold Blood, and they're, uh, they're looking to um, see you know, who they could cast here. Why don't you come down and join us? So I did, and um, that's how I got cast as Nancy Clutter in the film of In Cold Blood. What did that lead to? Um, it led to my coming to New York without having, you know, I was not one of those young people who had a plan. Uh, I just thought when I when that when that happened to me, I thought, I guess I'll do this. Uh, so I didn't have any underpinnings. Uh, so I came to New York. I got uh, a job at Macy's. Um, uh, but the great thing is that I uh, was accepted uh, into Uta Hagen's class. Wow. The great, and uh, I studied, I ended up, well, I ended up getting married uh, because <laughs> uh, I was selling Agua Lavanda men's cologne, and uh, it was the same year as um, the movie A Man and a Woman. And it was this French movie. It was very with Jean Jean Louis Trentignon and Anouk May, and it had this beautiful theme. Anyway, this very handsome man came towards the counter, and was 
buying uh, Agua Lavanda men's cologne and um, he asked me out and I ended up marrying him. So <laughs> that, that same night? <laughs> uh, just, well, uh, yeah, I was snowed. And also I just, you know, I was so, I was a very young 23. I didn't, you know, and I, you know, I hadn't come out and I, I think I was trying to just, I, I thought I was just, you know, I, I my best friends were married. They were a young couple in Uta's class. So I thought, I'm going to be like them. And, um, but boy, all I can say is uh, <laughs> a year and a half, I was very lucky to get out of it. Um, in that class with Uta, were, were any famous people or people who became famous in that class with you? Oh my gosh, I wish I had had a chance to think on that question so many so many i know i'm gonna blank but um, oh, that's that, that's fine um, so what was your first break in new york uh i got a job um in a production of our wilderness uh it's the one comedy that eugene o'neill wrote and um ted mann who was the artistic director of Circle in the Square then, um, was uh, directing and casting. And uh, so he cast me. And it was done at the Ford's Theater in Washington, DC. And uh, the wonderful Geraldine Fitzgerald was the mother. So, and Lucy Soroyan played the, I played Muriel McComber. And uh, Lucy Soroyan, the daughter of, um, William Soroyan um, played the daughter, and uh, I was married then. And <laughs> um, yeah, so that was my first job. And then I don't know. Um, yeah, and then I started getting work. I started, I, I did uh, The Cherry Orchard with Ann Jackson. Uh, at the Hartford Stage Company, and I did, um, oh, I did the Ghost Sonata at Yale Rep, a, a, a Strindberg play, uh, and Andre Serban, the great Romanian director, directed that. Uh, so, and I was very active at um, the public theater, and Joe Papp was, a, you know, the big presence there then. All right, you mentioned earlier you got laughs on your first time on stage and you really liked it, but you've been playing some heavy roles there that you've mentioned. Which do you prefer? Uh, I prefer comedy. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I you know have tremendous uh, respect for great writing. And so I, I, you know, I love to sink my teeth into, you know, a great part. Um, but you know i'm kind of a serious person but i you know i there is that thing you know you just have to trust me there is that thing inside me that um is funny and it's it's when i'm the happiest i totally understand <laughs> all right we're going to take a short break right now but we're going to come back and talk about more of what you, of your past work and we've got some pictures we've got a film clip we've got lots more to talk about, about to brenda we'll be right back Wow, we've got much more to talk to Brenda about. Russell, come on in. Hey, oh, I love this interview with Brenda. She has such stories and such a background and, and a wealth of knowledge and connections. Yeah, and just fa fascinating her growing up in the South and how she developed her, her love of theater and what she did with it. So, and we've got many more stories from her coming up. And what else do we have coming up? Well, don't forget we've got... Amber's altercations, we've got Rocco, we've got a rant, and we've got that tribute to Mike, and we've got so much more with Brenda coming up that you won't want to miss a moment of it. And you know what keeps all that moving right along, Amber? What? 
the Boostiers, who we love. If you haven't yet, please use that Venmo at RJD Pro or go to AmberLive.tv and look for the donate button and you can become a Boostier and you can help us keep getting amazing guests like Brenda. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, let's get back to Brenda right now. Brenda, oh my, I've already heard so much about your career. But you mentioned your first movie was In Cold Blood. Now, Truman Capote, was he around when that was being filmed? He was around for uh, one week. It was press week. And he was not welcome on the set. He and Richard Brooks, the director, had had a big fight. Richard Brooks now owned the rights to his book to make this movie. Um, so he made himself kind of scarce. And we were, we were staying in uh, the Garden City Motel. And that was, I mean, I can't tell you how, you know, it was just the, the most modest uh, hotel, motel imaginable. Modest. <laughs> <laughs> Moderist. <laughs> um, and and we, uh, Paul Huff, the uh, boy who played my brother, uh, Canyon Clutter, and I got word that Truma Capote um, had requested uh, meeting us uh, and would we please go to his room. So, of course, uh, we did. And, uh, you know, he was in like, you know, one of those plain little rooms. And he had a uh, he had a terrible cold, and he was propped up against you know the the sort of sad pillows. But he was propped up, and he was blowing his nose. I remember on a bath towel, and he uh, we were sitting at the foot of the bed, and he just began to talk to us, and it was um, he. Well, he talked about what it was like for him to first come when he first came to Kansas to that was the very same day he had seen the uh, the little piece on the front page of the New York Times that said family of four murdered for no apparent reason. And he came out there with a uh, Harper Lee, actually. Uh -huh. um, but my point is, is that the way he talked to us. Um, there was such a sense of just intimacy. He just was, he was interested in us and he needed to talk. He said it was the last time he'd ever come to Kansas. I think it was a very painful um, visit for him. And, um, you know, I, I did go to New York uh, after, um, uh, after I graduated, and I shared a room, I shared an apartment with uh, Mary Linda Rappelier, who played Susan Kidwell in the movie. And we got a note from Truman Capote saying, um, I saw a, whatever the word is, the, um, the print, the, I, saw, I saw the movie last night, it hadn't been released yet. And I think you girls should be very proud. And I would love to take you to lunch at the plaza. And that he did. And, um, you know, I had just moved to New York and I just thought all of life was going to be that way. It, <laughs> it wasn't. I mean, it was. But uh, and. Um, and so there's been so much talk about Truman Capote and the movies about him and um but the man that i met was he just i loved i i felt love for him oh. i felt that's yeah. so nice that's yeah. very very still, nice still do very nice Okay, um, let, Russell, we have a, some film clips of some of uh, Brenda's work. Let's watch that. When are you going to perform again, Tommy? <laughs> He's so traumatized by that stint in D.C. Oh, <laughs> He's so traumatized by the eighth grade. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I'm out, ladies. It was another bad day for uniforms. 
Will you tell your grown-ass daughter to do her own damn shirts? My baby needs me. Oh. See if she can play next week. Kathy's getting her hip replaced. No, I'm not. She's getting her knee replaced. I have the hip. I love you, Aunt Marcy. Mm -hmm. This is a penis. Aunt Marcy. <laughs> Come on. We have all kinds of penis delight. Oh, my God. Blue balls, penis. I've never Mom. seen so many penises. <laughs> I feel like I'm back in Vegas. <laughs> 30 years ago. <laughs> I taught you that move. My whisker biscuit hurts. Your whisker biscuit? My pooter. Um, My mush mitten. Your vagina? Oh, that's right. Ever since my little Terry was born. And, uh, how long ago was that? 64 years ago in September. Hello there, young fellow. Hi. Is your mommy or daddy home? My mom's in there. Do you like tuna casserole? No, it's heinous. Afternoon, Mr. Edward. Good afternoon, Miss Maybell. Is Gosma home? George is over at Jimbo's trailer. Apparently, he wrecked his bike last night and he's pretty banged up. Oh, gracious. He may be coming to stay with us for a while. Well, I hope Jimbo will be all right. Mm. Gosmer has always been such a caring young woman. Anything else I can help you with? Would you mind giving this elastic to Gosmer for me? I want her to use it on the seersucker skirt she's working on. Yeah, I'll put it on his workstation with a note on it. All right, then. Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Midbell, I'll be glad to carry that bag the rest no. of the way for you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Edward. You don't seem to know a strong woman when you see one. Stanley! See? You're in trouble. Man trouble. You got it. You can count on Let's party. <laughs> Those are wonderful clips. Wonderful. So you keep pretty busy. I do. I do. There's a writer's strike now. Uh, so I'm now it's a chance to um, do some stage work. But, Very yeah. good. All right, you've worked with some famous people. Um, tell, tell me about them. Let's say um, The World According to Garp, um, some of the stars in that movie. Tell us about your experiences. Well, it was Robin Williams and, um, and Glenn Close um, uh, and George Roy Hill was the director. Um, it was, you know, it, the, the, the book uh, was such an extraordinary sensation. Um, and so, uh, you know, watching the movie, I always give them, I always give it as an example of, um, one of the great screen adaptations because the book had its own personality and the movie also has its own personality. So it's true to the book in that way. But Robin Williams, <clears throat> he, um, what I remember the most is, and, um, you know, I killed, uh, he plays Garp and I play Pooh Percy who kills Garp, but between takes, he would do this, you know, he would, um, he was young then and he played Garp, um, and it, he would have this, these sensitive scenes and then the director would call cut. And, um, and the minute the director would call cut, Robin Williams would start um, uh, entertaining the crew, just <laughs> manic. Like he would, he would. It would just feed. He would just feed on his own cueing, and every and and he would do it right up until the director would say action for the next scene. And I've heard many stories that he, that's what that's who he was, and um, so that was an extraordinary thing too. 
to um, to be right there and just you, you you couldn't believe his energy that he could do that he, that he didn't you know need a cup of coffee or, or something and then you know it was the early days for Glenn Close and she played the you know the great character of uh, his mother Jenny um, she had been in a musical or two on Broadway Mary Beth Hurt yes. played his wife um, John Lithgow played uh, yes the um, uh, what was what was her name R uh, Roberta Roberta and uh, it was just wonderful so that was probably one of the first trans um, uh, characters in a major film I believe I I wonder and I I just I loved what uh, J uh, John Lithgow just played her the way he would play any other character you know he just from the inside out he's very talented very talented now i read somewhere that you worked with tom cruise or you had an encounter with tom cruise. oh okay. well i was in a movie called taps and that was his first movie that was his first movie with um timothy hutton was the lead but it was these valley forge cadets and um it was Sean Penn and well, anyway, Tom Cruise. Uh, he was the sweetest boy. And and he was he he just had wonderful manners. And he, you know, he would always sort of catch my eye and you know, kind of wave and um ask if he could you know if i wanted something from the honey wagon or and so um i adored him and uh years later he was already a star he'd done risky business and um well risky okay. business made him a star yeah. uh for for sure but i i had moved to la i was uh i was recovering from a breakup and i was just like roadkill <laughs> and i was in one of those huge la grocery stores on a saturday night kind of on the early side you know the big old cart and i i just you know i really just did not know what to do with myself um except and i didn't know what to buy or anything and i see somebody waving at me at the cash register with a cart full of beer and cokes and potato chips and you name it and it was tom cruise and he was waving and he said i'm giving a party tonight do you want to come well i, I was you know it just I, he he did that he i just you know lit from within but can you believe it i didn't go to the party <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, Russell, we have some pictures of Brenda. Would you uh, share some of those, please? Tell us about this. That's um, uh, that's me as Nancy Clutter. Um, that's uh, the actual horse, Babe, that was Nancy Clutter's actual horse. And I, uh, I remember I went and rode Babe bareback. And I didn't even need the reins. Uh, I could tell Babe was just, you know, kind of going along uh, the orchard in uh, the exact same paths where I'm imagining that Nancy rode Babe. And that particular um, that particular pose was, I the director said, look down uh, because the Clutters had this tree lined very long drive approach to their ranch house and it was the clouds were gathering in the in the sky and uh, so it's kind of a moody uh, it was kind of a moody feeling but the director said uh, just look down the, look down that road as if you see a car uh, coming and of course that was mirrored by you know much later in the film because the murder scenes or a flashback at the end but you see that car coming in 
Well, they turn off the they turn off the engine so that it doesn't make any noise and it just you know glides along, uh, approaching the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another picture. Oh well, that's from Chad. <laughs> and um, <laughs> what? Linda, whoa. <laughs> That's from Chud. Um, so, a, a man named Doug Cheek uh, directed it, and, and it, we, we did we shot it in Soho, in New York City. And he said, "Just walk along that street, and when I say um, scream, uh, just you have to pretend like you see something coming out of the sidewalk." So <laughs> that's what I did. And so that that picture looks like it's just you know like ordinary trash on the. So I hadn't actually seen Chud at that moment, but it, that was coming up soon. I'm sure there was some very ah well. That's um, me pointing the gun right at Robin Williams, and he looks up from the wrestling mat uh, where he's um, teaching uh, students, uh, and he looks up and says who and i shoot him um and there is a story that goes along with that do you have some time <laughs> sure sure well i had been filming taps uh in pennsylvania and you know in this business you never know when you're gonna i already had the job to do the world according to God, but nobody would knew when I'd be called to set. So I remember I uh, uh, um, I lost out on thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in residuals, how because I didn't sign a run of the. Um, thank goodness, because I was in a hotel room in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, when I heard I needed to be on the set of the world according to Garp the next morning. And I, you know, I, I, I the next, the only scene I had, to, they were keeping me for was to be maybe even the back of my head for being a mother for these, uh, for one of the cadets. And I, um, I skipped town, I left, I left and I, um, got myself to the studio in because the role in the world according to garp was the role I, and so i was really you know i i was really you know playing with danger because you just don't do that so the scene uh the first thing that happens when i get on set is i they dress me up in the nurse's uniform give me a gun and it's you know it's one of the ones that when you pull the trigger there's a kick there it, you know it it there's it's a blank but there's a kickback and it's 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 not a nothing thing to do mm -hmm. and also um from my fall off the cliff i have a fused ankle and i'm very self-conscious about my feet and don't you know the camera focused on my feet coming down the steps as I enter the wrestling room and I make my way through these boy wrestlers and I on my way I pass um, Mary Beth Hurt who's sitting on the bleachers reading a book uh, waiting you know just keeping her husband company somewhat and I make my way through this uh, these, this group of boys wrestling and on mats, and Robin Williams looks up and says, Pooh, I shoot. And, um, and then all the wrestlers tackle me. Ooh. Yeah, and I'm seeing I'm about to run out of juice. I'm going to uh, put this, my plug in. All the wrestlers um, uh, tackle me and it was a perfect take except that one of the boys smiled and so they had to do it all over again and so I remember I turned around with the gun and I said who, who smiled 
Um, but we did it again, and it was another perfect take. So the minute that scene was over, I was called up to the executives uh, offices and the, the, uh, there was executives from uh, the 20th Century Fox the, uh, that were from the taps and they were, they were, uh, they were, uh, they were about to arrest me or, or sue me. Um, and I remember the, the executive from Warner Brothers, I think it was Warner Brothers who produced uh, the world according to Garp, and he said, "If we didn't have that scene in the can, but it it went so well that that they they somehow settled it." And um, I never tell that story because I behaved so badly. <laughs> but I was, you know, you had to do what you had to do. I had to do what I had to do. Okay, Brenda, we're going to end this segment. We're going to be back for one more segment to talk about two of your favorite projects. So we'll be right back with Brenda. Okay, great. We've got another segment coming up with Brenda telling us some really powerful stories of two great interests of hers. You'll want to stick around. But now it's time for altercations. <laughs> Altercations is our weekly report in response to those who say it's the drag queens grooming and molesting children. Who is really putting children in danger? Well, let's take a look at Corey Herthel. Corey was a pastor at the Green Bay, Wisconsin Seventh-day Adventist Church until he was arrested this month and charged with attempted production of child pornography and transferring obscene material to a child. He met the child in Venezuela while performing missionary work and maintained contact with the child online. He encouraged the minor to send him videos of their genitalia in exchange for monetary payments. He is further alleged to have sent the child images of his genitals. Previously, we told you about Baylor University pastor Chris Hundle, who was arrested for continuous sexual abuse of a young child. According to the arrest affidavit, Hundle drove the boys to Daniel Sabala's house. Well, this week, Zavala was arrested, who was also associated with Baylor's Assemblies of God's Chai Alpha Campus Ministries, and he was arrested for sex abuse charges involving minors. Birds of a feather? And then there's Daryl Stagg, a prominent Louisiana Baptist leader in central Louisiana area, and he was arrested and charged for three counts each of oral sexual battery, first-degree rape, aggravated crimes against nature, and indecent behavior with juveniles the sheriff is concerned that there may be other victims related to the case. Now, I haven't heard of any drag queens being busted for any of these crimes this week. Have you? Hmm. That's this week's altercations. And now, our final segment with Brenda. Okay, Brenda, you have two organizations that I'm familiar with. Tell me about the, the organization for young girls. Well, um, Amber, I, I, let's see, I was about to become 50, and I, um, I just felt my world was getting smaller, so I actually left um, the business of show and went to graduate school and got a master's degree in anthropology. And in, I was... Anthropology, I know, go figure. Um, I did my field work in Chiapas, Mexico and um, wrote about, a, I did my thesis about a con contemporary Mayan theater company. But when I came back, I, I, um, I just had, well, Actually, I'm remembering what really happened. Um, I was going through that break, one of those breakups in my life, and um, uh, I was writing my thesis, and a, a great a producer friend of mine, Lynn Austin, she was concerned about me, and she said, um, "You know, um, Jessica Balboni is uh, she's uh, working with a group of um, adolescent girls down on St. Mark's Place. You should um, 
you should go check out what she's doing. Uh, she might, you know, need some help. And so I had no interest whatsoever in doing that. I had no interest in doing anything at that moment. Uh, but I, I, I was, I needed to be polite. So I politely called up Jessica and I said, uh, Lynn says that uh, I should come to, that you're doing marvelous work with teenage girls and that I should, um, um, come down and observe. And she said, well, you can't, you can't come down and observe. You could come participate. So I went down there and I participated and Amber, it, everything inside me changed from, and, um, so that's when Jessica Balboni and I, uh, started to plan our own program called what girls know. And we spent months making a business plan and wrote grant proposals. And it was the moment in time when there was real attention on um, the crisis that adolescent girls go through um, coming from childhood and making that transition into puberty and adolescence that they lose, they, they, there's a loss of self and uh, they just, they, you know, lose themselves. And, and of course I discovered, you know, I was a stutterer and I remembered what theater did for me and emotionally, not just speech wise, but emotionally at age 12. Um, so that moment in time benefited us by, we were uh, immediately funded. And so I ended up, um, Jessica and I uh, worked with two different groups of girls. Then she went on to become the education director at the 92nd Street Y. I took over a directorship of What Girls Know and I ended, Linda Lavin uh, brought me down. Um, she had purchased three or four houses in Wilmington, North Carolina and wanted to start an arts uh, foundation there to introduce herself to the town. She was going to move there. And we were friends and uh, I had sent her my, one of the, my proposals and she called me up one Sunday and she said, I'd like you to come down and, um, and, and begin your program as a way of my uh, introducing the Linda Lavin Arts Foundation. So I ended up directing it in Wilmington, uh, in different parts of, parts of the country. That's how I ended up in New Orleans. It, it found its home there. So, and, and I, I um, Jessica and I did it kind of by the seat of our pants in the beginning, but then I, I, I got a real education from a great school out of NYU. It's um, now it's at CUNY in New York, but it's a, it's a methodology for creating original theater from the ideas of young people. So over the, I did, I directed it for 15 years and we had some of the most wonderful product. I mean, my theory was always that I wasn't doing this work, you know, it wasn't do good or work. It was, it was to make excellent theater together. I thought that's, what's going to benefit these girls is, you know, to, because theater is, you know, it addresses every developmental uh, area of a kid, um, cognitive, physical, emotional, cultural, you know, it, you name it. And it's like a shortcut to um, expressing themselves. Yeah. And it's just, it's, there's just nothing like it. So how, how wonderful, how wonderful. Now tell me about your interest in Tennessee Williams. Oh, I, I love Williams. I, I love Tennessee. Sometimes I refer to myself as a Southerness because I've also spent many, many years in uh, adapting Eudora Welty's stories for the stage. So Williams is a, uh, I love his writing so much and I've done, I, I can't even tell you the number of Tennessee Williams. In fact, I, I'm going to St. Louis um, in the Monday after Labor Day to do um, a one act called Something Unspoken. It's a really interesting play. Um, 
And two years ago, I did the Glass Menagerie in St. Louis. In the actual, it was during COVID, so it was outside using, actually using the actual fire escapes where Williams, where so much of the play takes place. Um, so yes, and and I'm I've, I'm involved in all the Tennessee Williams festivals in Provincetown, New Orleans, St. Louis, Columbus, Mississippi, Clarksdale, Mississippi. Um, every every place that where there's a festival is a place where Williams that had a a real significance either in his career or in his childhood or where he was born. He fell in he fell in love for the first time in Provincetown. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I fell in love many times in a night in Provincetown. That was that's lucky. <laughs> I think. <laughs> but, Brenda, thank you so much for talking to us. What a fascinating career! And the wonderful thing is, it's not over. You've got so much ahead of you, and I can't wait to hear more. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been my honor, Amber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda. We're going to have to have her back. She has a lot more stories to tell. As we mentioned earlier, today was the celebration of life of our good friend, Mike Hayes, Marguerite LeMay, my drag sister. There's so much to say about them. And a couple of weeks ago, we did a tribute. Here's a segment of that tribute. The foundation of the House of Omey was started when two young men in their early 30s, Bob Bolliard and Mike Hayes, wanted more outlets to perform. They'd been part of the Vermont Cares Cabaret Players with Mike's sister Nancy and good friend Cindy Zook and others, raising money for the local AIDS resource organization. Drag wasn't a thing in Burlington at the time. Sure, at Halloween, there'd be a few messes and dresses, but the only regular performers, performers were past Amber Live guests Yolanda and Cherry Tart. In watching one of their shows, Bob and Mike looked at each other and said, we can do that. And they did. The first gig was New Year's Eve, 1993. It was at the Sheraton Hotel for the New Year's Eve party for the Vermont Gay Social Alternatives. Marguerite made our dresses. Our friend Mel Deo styled our hairs, our wigs, and we appeared with Cindy Zook, who would later become Cousin Crystal LeMay, and were accompanied by Craig Hilliard, now known to you as Cousin Craig. Now, in those early years, we didn't always look very P-R-E-T-T-Y. Uh, this was at a Super Bowl party we hosted, uh, a Mardi Gras celebration, and as the Queens of Denial in a Pride Day float. The first 10 years of the House of LeMay were chronicled in a documentary called Slingbacks and Syrup, which was written and filmed by our own Russell Dreyer. In it, each of us were given a chance to talk about ourselves. Here is Mike, Maggie's segment. It took more than one person to create something as complex as the House of LeMay. You had these two people with their own sets of talents that were a perfect fit for each other. And it, it wouldn't have worked without both of them. In the background, I saw Mike, Bob's roommate. We're housemates, not roommates. We share a house, not a room. We're not a couple. Let me make that very clear. Sorry. In the background, I saw Mike, Bob's housemate, making his own impact by creating the look of the house through costume design. Obviously, a drag act, there's, there's very little that's more critical than the costumes. In The Mad Woman of Shiel, there I don't, never get the line right, but basically, she, when she gets dressed, she grabs her jewelry box, throws it up in the air, and wherever the jewelry lands, that's where she pins it. And that's sort of the feeling that I like from the outfits. It's like, okay, I have a little extra trim. Well, I don't want to just throw it away. I'll add it somewhere. And, you know, okay, uh, do these shoes make my tits look too big? You know, that's sort of the whole attitude with the costumes, I think. 
his talent of, of you know the costume design and everything else is is right right on target and would give us quite literally the shirt off his back or better yet would pull out the fabric and design and make the shirt for us um, and that I that I really appreciate about Mike I'm a native from Monta I was born here at the uh, Fletcher uh, well it was the Fanny Allen Hospital then but here in Burlington the first time I did drag was in college we were doing a Tennessee Williams show Camino Rail and I played among other 12 parts running through the show, I played Nursi, who was a Mexican nursemaid, a, a, a duena. I don't, I don't, it's been so long, I don't think I have the term right. But that was the first time I was drag. And it was less pretty than I am now, <laughs> if that's possible. Yes, I was at Johnson State there. College, and, and they used to have a summer right. program to go to New York City for the theater, for the ensemble studio theater. So during the daytime, I was taking theater classes, acting, uh, doing apprenticeship for doing sets and stuff like that. And, at the night, I earned extra money at the Broadway Arms Bath as a stripper. Mike, perhaps, I would say, is, is the most level-headed, common-sense, down-to-earth. You know, that's how I paid for my next year of college, was as a stripper. I didn't come out to my mother until just after my father died. We were even coming home from um, the wake. We'd stopped at a grocery store. Well, on the way back to the grocery store, I told my mother, and I said, that's the only thing I regret is not having told my father that I was gay. And it was great. We got to the grocery store, we went in to get groceries, we went back out to the car, and we had locked the keys in the car, and it was ready. We were so both so <laughs> about me telling <laughs> that we had forgotten the keys. He's got this great effervescence that just, uh... You know, he, he brings out happiness in people. It wasn't bad at all. No. It didn't bother me. No. What was it, Amber said? No, tased. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't hurt as much as being tasered. <laughs> While Mike was usually a quieter soul than Bob, I learned through our friendship that he had his own ways of making his point when he wanted to tell you something. For example, Mike unconsciously found his own unique way of telling his mother that he did drag. So I had a whole set of pictures to show mom, and she wanted a couple. So I said, here, take the book and pick out what you want, and I'll have copies made for you. And she did, but accidentally I left a picture of Amber and Marguerite in our new dresses with Cindy standing between us, who is a foot shorter in flats, let alone us in foreign heels and hair. And she handed them back to me, said, I would like a number five, a number 12, and a number 15. And oh, by the way, those dresses came out nice. <laughs> and I said, uh, 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 you think so? Yes. In the picture, you should smile, though. <laughs> I think we complement each other, things that he likes to do. Uh, either I don't like to do them, so he does them, or we like to do things together. Marguerite is a sassy, larger, middle-aged um, babe who's always on the make for men and food. Maggie pictures herself leaning against a full-length, full full-size baby grand. A slinky black dress slid up to her hip, uh, and a lot smaller than she is now, but thing this bluesy sort of vampy thing, which is nothing at all has to do with what she looks like. <laughs> Everyone usually hears, humors me well about doing my torch songs and my unrequited love songs. And Maggie brings, I think, a tender element. Um, Whereas, whereas Amber might come across as harsh, Maggie comes across, and, and she can be just as cutting, if not more so sometimes. But she comes off as more lovable. We had dreams, like all of you had dreams, but we grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. Believe it or not, even at a trailer park, there's a wrong side. I don't need your love to make me strong.
always with us, always will be. Same thing with Rocco Zamboni. Rocco, what you got for me? Hey, how you doing? This is Rocco. Yeah, I know I'm sitting here naked, depressed, sad. It's because of that, that, that submarine thing. All right, that cylinder, that tube, whatever it was that went down looking for the Titanic, and now it's crushed and stuff. I'm sad. Number one, I, I should have been on that because I was going to go on it, but the guy's like, nah, I'm already full. Go on the next one. So now I ain't going to get to go. Thanks a lot, guys. But the other thing is, I said, listen, here's this super industrial shop vac that I designed. Take it with you because the floor and that thing's going to get dirty. You're all sitting on the floor. So I said, you know, when you get to about 2,000 feet under, turn it on because it's got extra suction power then. That may have been a mistake, all right? I might have overstepped my bounds there, I'm assuming. But, you know, the, the problem is, really, that I'm not going to get my vacuum back. It's, it's down with the Titanic, sucking up God knows what. It's probably still running because that thing had a battery on it that would last for like 30 years. So the ocean floor is going to get pretty clean. Maybe the Titanic itself won't have any, uh, you know, algae or whatever fish poop on it. So I'm a little upset about it, though. I got to admit, it would have been a cool experience to be down there checking out the Titanic through some sort of dishwasher window. But again, it didn't turn out too good either. So I probably saved myself some money and aggravation. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you that I feel bad. I, I, I didn't mean to do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. I just said, here, use this super sucking vacuum inside your little cylinder submarine at 2,000 feet below sea level. What's well, a big deal? Anyone would do that. Come on. All right, so uh, this is Rocco saying, oops. Love that Rocco. And now it's time for this week's rant. This week in Manchester, New Hampshire, former Amber Live guest Juicy Garland was holding her monthly drag story hour at the Teetotaler. All we were doing was promoting literacy and providing kids with cute and good stories, she said. And then Proud Boys wearing masks, how brave, and hats with the number 131 arrived and shouted, banged on the windows, and did Nazi salutes. Oh, oh yeah. In New Jersey, a scuffle broke out among the hundreds of people attending a school board meeting protesting the inclusion of a pride sign on school properties. What? But last Saturday, Lucy Bell and I attended, spoke, and performed at the first Rutland County Vermont Pride celebration. It was a glorious yet rainy day. Organizers were hoping, with good weather, that two or 3,000 people would attend. In pouring rain, over 4,000 people showed up and there was no backlash from the community. All over Vermont, Barrie, Bellows Falls, Bennington, Bethel, Bradford, Brattleboro, Burlington, East Montpelier, Essex, Londonville, Middlebury, Montpelier, Newport, Rockingham, Rutland, Springfield, St. Albans, White River Junction, and Windsor, pride parades, festivals, or events that included their whole communities were held. I haven't heard of any counter-protests. If there have been, they were minor. No Proud Boys, no scuffles. As we close out Pride Month, let's all remember that Vermont is the state of freedom and unity and hope that those ideas spread nationwide. I want to thank Brenda Corrin for coming on the show tonight and for Russell for all the work he did to put this show together. We'll see you next week. But for right now, let's see some Boog and Shug. Why do you always pick your nose? Oh, I don't know. 
I'm just bored, I guess. You could pick your favorite episode of Amber Live instead. I think I'll stick with the boogers. <laughs>